in Oklahoma City, God is answering the prayers of people all over the world. We are having the largest crowds night after night that we've ever had in any city in the United States during the first two weeks. Hundreds are responding to the invitation to receive Christ. Religion has become the chief topic of conversation in Oklahoma, and people are coming from all over the southwestern part of the United States during the next few days to see God at work in Oklahoma. There's a great sense of the presence of God in the services. Richmond and Oklahoma City were the first crusades we had conducted in the United States for nearly two years. I seem to sense a deepening in these crusades. People are more hungry for Christ than at any other period that I can remember in my ministry. The response to the gospel in Virginia and Oklahoma City has been beyond anything we've ever experienced before. Perhaps the great revival that we've long prayed for is on the way. All of us on our team agree that there's a depth to these meetings that we've never before experienced in this country. We would appreciate your continued prayers as the meetings gather momentum. A good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets to our society. It's a strange thing to me how we honor motherhood but often forget the father. Mothers should be honored, but why forget father? In the days when father was the sole means of the family's support and the family life in the pioneer setting was much simpler, dad was respected for his ability to earn the family's bread by the sweat of his brow. But today, when mother works as a secretary, sister in the downtown office, and little brother at the corner filling station, dad is considered just another source of income instead of as the only means of family support. That may partially account for the neglect of father. However, According to the Bible, the male parent was created for much more than just to help bring in family support. He was the human counterpart of God himself. He was to serve as not only provider, but example, instructor, high priest, disciplinarian, and guide for the children and the household. Time after time, through the Bible, we read of fathers exerting strong influences over their children and household. The Bible says concerning Abraham, for I know him, that he will command his children and household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. The Bible pictures Isaac as blessing his son. David gives godly counsel to his son Solomon. Zacharias, the consecrated father of John the Baptist, praises God for his goodness. And Cornelius leads his entire family into the light of Christianity. Job dedicates his children to God, and the Philippian jailer leads his household to Christ. However, in these modern days, the word father in some areas has come to mean a character with a highball in one hand, a cigarette in the other, and nothing but sinful mischief in his heart. Thank God this is only true in a small segment of our society, but unfortunately this idea is growing as fathers take less and less responsibility in the home. But ladies and gentlemen, if society is to be saved from the moral moros into which it is slowly sinking, fathers are going to have to take their God-given place in the home. One of the greatest needs in America is for men who will muster the moral courage and appropriate the spiritual strength to lead their families by example and precept in the ways of God and character building. One out of every four marriages in America ends in divorce. The home is breaking and crumbling. All sociologists agree that the home is the basic unit of society. And if the American home is to be saved, fathers must find God and dedicate themselves to the building of strong homes. Too long has the spiritual responsibility of the home been placed upon the frail shoulders of the mother. God needs men who have the courage to lift high the standard of salvation in their homes and communities. He needs men who have the strength to take a stand against the avowed enemies of the home. God needs men with consecrated intelligence to teach their children the danger of the wrong. There are several suggestions that I want to give to all you fathers today. First, be sure that you know Christ as your Lord, Master, and Savior. In this confusing and complicated age in which we live, it is impossible for you to be a good husband or a good father without the help of Christ. Most of you really want to be a faithful husband and a good father but you find something continually pulling and tugging at you. You're often tempted to be unfaithful to your wife, and you find that you're almost too busy to be the kind of a father you know you ought to be. You know that you should be taking your children to Sunday school and church, 
You also know that you should be leading your children in family devotions. But somehow you don't do it. And a spiritual conflict rages in your soul. One father confided in me this past week that his children are nearly grown and he hardly knows them. No wonder one of them has already been in a juvenile court. Without Christ, it is impossible for you to be a proper husband and father that you ought to be. Therefore, the first step is to repent of your sins and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. At that precise moment, Christ will come into your heart, forgive the past sins and mistakes and give you a new life. You will find a new consecration and dedication to your family that Christ will give. Even while I'm speaking to you, you can open your heart and let Christ in. You know that you haven't been the kind of father that you ought to be. And one of the reasons is you haven't had time for God, Christ, and the church. Give your life to Christ right now and determine that from this moment on, you're going to live for Him. Secondly, realize that building a good, happy, successful home is a major responsibility. To have a happy, successful home takes work. So often fathers take their homes for granted. They're not willing to be inconvenienced or disturbed in their pleasure, recreation, and business by the mundane and monotonous events of the home. Many fathers spend most of their time away from the home at other types of work and responsibility in order to escape home responsibilities. This is a tragic sin, not only against your family, but against God. When God puts you at the head of a home, you have a tremendous and overwhelming responsibility, and God will hold you accountable for your children. Some time ago, a distinguished juvenile judge said, when I get off the bench, I'm going to write a book, and I'm going to call it, I Hate Parents. He had become disgusted with the way parents have reneged their primary duties, the training of children in the home. One probation officer said recently, from the amount of vandalism that goes on in this town, you'd think the kids had no fathers. Thousands of teenage children are wandering around the streets in the early morning hours. Their parents don't know where they are, and many times they don't care. Some parents leave for the weekend and leave the children at home to shift for themselves. One father recently said, I pay my boys clothes, I feed him, I give him an allowance. What more do you expect of me? Many fathers do not realize that they are responsible for their children's mental and spiritual growth and character building as well as feeding and clothing them. Many citizens are calling on police to do more to check the one million juvenile delinquents across the country. However, I'm persuaded it is not delinquents that need checking, it is fathers who need to be checked. In the sight of God, fathers are responsible for the training of their children. If they fail, God is going to hold them responsible. Thirdly, I would suggest that fathers take time with their children. I heard about a father who gave his boy a Christmas present. He wrapped up a little note in a package and the note read, Son, during the next year, I'm going to give you one hour every day and two hours on Sunday. The little boy ran and put his arm around his dad and said, Oh, Dad, that's the best Christmas present I've ever had. Your children not only require a great deal of your time, but they long and hunger for it. Perhaps they don't show it and express it, but that hunger and love is there just the same. Be a pal to your children. Love them. Spend hours with them. Cut out some of your so-called important social and business engagements and make the center of your social life the home. God will honor you, and your children will grow up to call you blessed. Fourthly, set your children a good example. I heard about a lawyer who walked to his office every morning. It was his usual custom to stop at the corner bar for a drink. On a certain morning, the snow had fallen, and he heard a sound behind him. Turning, he saw his seven-year-old son stepping as far as he could in dead his tracks in the new fallen snow. The father turned around and said, Son, what are you doing? The son replied, I'm stepping in daddy's tracks. The father sent his son back home, but that morning he couldn't go to the bar. All he could think of was stepping in daddy's tracks. When he was studying for his law case that day, the thought kept returning, stepping in daddy's tracks. About noon, he got down on his knees and accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior and said, from now on, I want my son to step in the tracks of a Christian father. Many fathers are good at lecturing and preaching to their children, but they are not good at setting an example daily in front of them. You want them to do as you say, but not as you do. 
an old Chinese proverb says. A picture is worth a thousand words. Yes, it is the duty and privilege of Christian fathers to so live before their children that they can see Christ in them. Our every word should be measured. Our every attitude evaluated. We must remember that our words and attitudes are being weighed carefully by our children and they will bring forth fruit for good or for evil. Visual education is now recognized as the most effective method of teaching. The eye is the shortest route to the brain, much shorter than the ear. So in spiritual things as well as academic things, example and illustration are most important. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, be an example. A good father should be an example in faith in Christ. This will more than anything else in the world create security in the mind and heart of the child. Too often, our faith as parents wavers and the child becomes to believe that we actually do not believe in God after all. Fifthly, don't neglect to properly discipline your children. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation teaches that fathers ought to discipline their children. Ephesians 6.4 says, Ye fathers, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In Proverbs 13.24 the Bible says, He that spareth the rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him. In Proverbs 23.13, God admonishes fathers to withhold not correction from the child. Again the Bible says, Correct thy son and he will give thee rest. Yea, he shall give thee delight to thy soul. A young man came to me this week here in Oklahoma City in serious trouble. When I got to the root of his problem, I found that it all started because his parents were too lenient. They had not properly taught and disciplined him as a child. If children are not taught to obey in the home, they're certainly not going to obey when they get out into society. A New York magistrate recently said, I've often advocated that every Brooklyn home should have a woodshed, not necessarily to be used for storing wood. Of course, the greatest means of discipline is not the woodshed or peach tree or the old-fashioned spanking. The greatest discipline that you can have for your children is to set an example before them because the majority of children acquire characteristics and habits of their parents. The Bible promises, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Some parents carry discipline too far by provoking their children to anger. The Bible says, provoke not your children to anger, lest they become discouraged. Discipline carried out in anger is the same as a fight between the father and child. Yes, fathers, to be a real father is a tremendous responsibility. Are you the kind of a father you ought to be? Have you been rearing your children properly? Have you been the kind of a husband in the home that you ought to be? God holds you responsible for the spiritual welfare of your children. If they turn out wrong, you will have to face God at the judgment day for your neglect. Today, right now, receive Christ as your Savior. Turn over a new leaf and determine from this moment that you're going to be the kind of father you ought to be to your children. The airports, the bus stations, and the train stations are jammed with thousands of people trying to get home for Christmas. We are in Washington, D.C. today, where tomorrow I will give the Christmas message at the Pentagon. I'm one of those hoping to find space on a plane or a train that will get me home in time for Christmas Eve. When the Wright brothers had finally made their flimsy plane lift itself by its own power from the sandy beach at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, they sent a telegram. After telling of the success of their efforts to fly, they added the most touching two words they could have sent. Home Christmas. Christmas is the intense family celebration. Other holidays are different. Good Friday and Easter are usually celebrated in the church. National days are honored with speeches, parades, and the ceremonies of government. But Christmas is glorified above all in the home because it is the celebration of a birthday. There's a pathetic irony in the celebration of this birthday. It is the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ, and yet Christ was born away from home, on a journey which symbolized the restless and wandering nature of the world in which he was born. He was born in the insecurity of a barn. This was a symbol of the fact that during his public ministry, he had very little home life. 
He roamed the roads and towns of ancient Palestine. Finally, he died in the solitary ordeal of the cross so that out of his loneliest hour, mankind could find a way of redemption. Christmas means different things to different people. To some businessmen, Christmas merely means an opportunity to make money. In our modern world, we've seen how Christmas has been commercialized. Competition is keen. Businessmen vie with each other in their preparation for the celebration of the occasion. Some of these men do not believe in Christ. They may even hate him. But Christmas has become big business and therefore cannot be ignored. Cash registers ring out a Merry Christmas to the ears of the mercenary minded. They are more concerned to hear about their profit from Christmas than to hear about the profit from Bethlehem. The clinking sound of money is sweeter music to some than the song of the angels above the manger. To many, Christmas carols cannot be heard because their earphones are tuned to television programs. Some minds are focused on Wall Street and their eyes are riveted to the ticker tape reports. In the pleasure world, Christmas means something else. Pleasure seeking consumes the time and thought of many persons. There are those who try to find a Merry Christmas in what they call living it up. Instead of imbibing the spirit of Christmas, they choose to imbibe Christmas spirits. For many people, the holiday is an opportunity to celebrate Christmas in the wrong way. Liquor flows freely with all the tragedies, disappointments, and frustrations that follow. During the Christmas holiday a few years ago, a man was arrested in New York City because of drunkenness and disorderly conduct. Yet he sang, I'm sitting on top of the world even while being taken to jail. He was not sitting on top of the world at all. The world was on top of him. The only time any man is on top of the world is when he is on top of the forces and vices that would drag him down. The Apostle Paul said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. It means to conquer our appetites and keep all our passions and desires under control. It means to conquer our hatreds, our fears, our doubts, and our anxieties. It means to conquer selfishness, even for special Christmas gifts for ourselves. You cannot have a Merry Christmas or a Happy New Year when you have become a slave to passions and vices that hound you. Such a man is not sitting on top of the world. The world is on top of him. He is in danger of being crushed to death. He is living in a fool's paradise. Paul wrote to Timothy, She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. These things, materialism, money, and pleasure, all are crowding Christ out of Christmas for multitudes this week. Many people this weekend are so busy with a thousand and one other things that they have no time to consider the message of the baby of Bethlehem. It reminds me of the day Abraham Lincoln was born in Kentucky. A neighbor hailed a man from town and said, Any news down at the village, Ezra? Well, Squire McLean's gone to Washington to see Madison sworn in, and old Spellman tells me this Bonaparte fella has captured most of Spain. What's new out here, neighbor? Nothing at all, nothing at all, except for a new baby down at Tom Lincoln's house. Nothing ever happens out here. The birth of a baby, but it was not important. Nothing ever happens out here. The birth of Abraham Lincoln was unimportant to him that day. Likewise, the birth of Jesus Christ was unimportant to many people in his day. Times have not changed. To millions, the true meaning of Christmas is unimportant. Today, our imaginations go back 2,000 years to that first Christmas when the world experienced three phenomena. First, there was the star. There were many stars in the sky, but none like this. This one shone with the aura and brilliance of another world. It was as though God had taken a lamp from the ceiling of heaven and hung it in the dark sky on a troubled world. Second, there was a new song in the air. A world which had lost its song learned to sing again. With the coming of God in the flesh, hope sprang in the heart of man and led by angelic beings. The whole world took up the refrain, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And thirdly, there was good news. The good news that at last a savior had come to save men from sin. His name shall be called Jesus and he shall save his people from their sins. He was the central theme of that first Christmas. The star, the song, the gifts, the kneeling, the joy, the hope, the excitement, all were because of him. As the Christmas carol says, the hopes and fears of all the years are wrapped in thee tonight.
If we could look through mighty telescopes or listen to electronic soundings, we could hear and see the metallic stars which both Russia and America have shot up into the air during the past year. None of these synthetic stars have brought peace to the world. But God's star promised peace to the whole world if man would believe and trust. Too often man's synthetic stars bring fear and anxiety. Our gadget-filled paradise suspended in a hell of international insecurity certainly does not offer us the happiness of which the former century dreamed. And there are other songs. Our airways today are filled with the sound of music. But what kind of music? Sad songs, cynical songs, jazz songs, folk songs, beat songs, rock and roll songs. What a wonderful thing it is to turn on the radio or to go downtown or turn on some television program this season and hear once again the gentle, tender, reverent songs of Christmas after months of ear-grinding sounds that grate as much on the nerves as they do the mind. There are other would-be saviors today, Castro, Mao Zedong, and a score of others who claim to be God's gift to the little people of the world. But how different from him who was rich and yet became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. Unto you is born this day a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. God incarnate, heaven and earth joined together, God and man reconciled, hope for the hopeless, pardon for the guilty, forgiveness for the conscience stricken, peace for those who know no peace, good news for those who have had nothing but bad news. This Christ is not dated. Calendars cannot contain him. History cannot confine him. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the great I Am. He is the Savior today, tomorrow, and forever. He saves us from despair. Pessimism is the mood of our times. I've talked to many of the world's great leaders, and one thing they all have in common is despair. The tensions, the conflicts, the seeming insoluble problems of this world tend to make them cynical and doubtful. Many cynics this Christmas will blame God for the troubles of the world. Man should blame himself. The trouble with man is man. Man has a spiritual disease, and the disease is sin. And until sin is conquered, the world is not going to be a better place in which to live. Man has willfully rejected the Prince of Peace, and he is paying a terrible price. A secular and materialistic society which has rejected the Prince of Peace is yielding to the pessimism and despair of our times. The blighting cynicism which has come as a result of our rejection of God is reflected in our literature, our art, our films, and even in our pulpits. Christmas should be a time of renewed hope. Not hope in the status quo, not hope in the Western world, not in your particular political concept, but Christmas hope, Christian hope, hope in Jesus Christ, hope that God is still in the shadows of history, hope that despite our tangled bungling that God will as always bring order out of chaos. The events of the past few months indicate that the world is moving toward the climax of its history. Christ stands at the door ready to return to this earth in blazing glory, majesty, and power. The Christmas hope should include the blessed hope that Christ may soon return to set up his kingdom. But Christmas is even more personal. When the angel said, and he shall save his people from their sins, they were touching the very heart of our need. There are many today who would rather not talk about sin. They do not want to face the realities of their spiritual disease. I heard of a man the other day who found conversation about cancer distasteful. Whenever the subject came up, he would walk away. He would not consent to periodic examination. He would permit no x-rays. But one day after a loss of weight and appetite, he was persuaded to have an examination. The doctors found a cancer of massive proportions. Had he faced up to the problem earlier, his chances of living would have been greater. So it is with sin. Our reluctance to discuss it, our tendency to resent anyone's talking about it, is a revelation of our secret fear that we might be a victim of it. Christ had a great deal to say about sin. This is why he came on that first Christmas night to save his people from their sins. No doctor in the world can treat sin. No psychiatrist in the world can cure sin. They can work on symptoms. They can help the sinner to live with his sins, but they cannot get rid of the disease. Only Christ can heal the disease of sin. This is what the cross is all about. And Christmas is not Christmas without a message on the cross of Christ. This is why he was born. This was the message on that first Christmas night. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, 
for he shall save his people from their sins. Christmas says that grace is greater than your sins. Christmas says that the sin question was answered at the cross. Christmas says that the cross went as deep as your need. It was the divine specific, the positive cure, offered, paid for, and administered by a loving God in his beloved Son. I never come to Christmas without thinking of the thousands who are lonely, diseased, and troubled at this time of year. Christmas is a reminder from God himself that we are not alone. The angel said his name shall be called Emmanuel. That means God with us. God revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. A reconciling love which rescues us from separation and loneliness. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. He struck a death blow to the loneliness of man. When he went away in the flesh, he said, Lo, I am with you even unto the end of the world. At this Christmas season, Christ is here. He is here to make people more generous, to fill them with goodwill, to give them hope, to forgive their sins, to give them a new song, to impart faith, to weld man into one body, the church. He is more alive today than when he walked the Emmaus Road. Man can still say, did not our hearts burn within us when we walked with him in the way? Nothing has been changed, only intensified after 2,000 years. Look around you, hear the song, see the light on the little children's faces, see the love in the face of a Salvation Army lass as she collects money on the street corner to feed hungry mouths. Christmas means that God is with us. Yes, there is still a star in the sky. There is still a song in the air. And Jesus Christ is more alive than ever before. He is alive to conquer despair, to impart hope, to forgive sins, and to take away our loneliness and reconcile us to God. Accept Jesus Christ this Christmas. Give him the gift he most wants, your heart. This is his birthday. Let us give him a gift worthy of his love. It has become traditional that every Christmas I read again a little poem which I've read each year at this time on the Hour of Decision that illustrates my message today. That night, when in Judean skies the mystic star dispensed its light, a blind man moved about in sleep and dreamed that he had sight. That night, when shepherds heard the song of host angelic hovering near, a deaf man moved in slumber's spell and dreamed that he could hear. That night, when in the cattle stall slept child and mother cheek by jaw, a cripple moved his twisted limbs and dreamed that he was whole. That night, when o'er the newborn babe the tender Mary rose to lean, a leper smiled in sleep and dreamed that he was clean. That night, when to the mother's breast the little king was held secure, a harlot slept a happy sleep and dreamed that she was pure. That night when in the manger lay the sanctified who came to save, a man moved in the sleep of death and dreamed there was no grave. We have been on the scene of two great conferences this past week, one here in Geneva and the other in London, where over 10,000 Baptist delegates are attending the Baptist World Alliance. The Geneva conference is now over. Thousands of weary people are now packing up and moving out. This past week will be recorded in history as one of the most important weeks in this decade. To those of us that have been on the scene here in Geneva, it has been a week filled with excitement, anticipation, surprises, disappointments, and fears. Geneva has been bulging at the seams with every hotel and private room in town occupied. This is the height of the tourist season, and with the added attraction of the Big Four, you can hardly breathe for the mass of diplomats, newspaper men, and sightseers. Some newspaper people have actually spent the night in the railroad station. Others have slept in the parks, and some have not slept at all. Tempers have on occasion been short, but by and large, this conference has gone along as smoothly as can be expected with so many people and so many problems. The two main attractions here have been the Premier of Russia and President Eisenhower. Eisenhower is popular in Europe, and every European wants a glimpse of him. Whether this historic conference has accomplished anything that will lead to ultimate peace in this Cold War, only history can say. One thing is certain. The news communiques have not told the world the full story. Only time will tell. Many people are optimistic, particularly those here in Europe. And yet I've met Americans, on the other hand, that are fearful, lest America has once again been led into a trap. There is another thing that is certain. 
and that is that the basic issues of the world today have not even been discussed in this conference. I have repeatedly said, and I strongly believe that our greatest problem is not bombs, war machines, or political philosophies. The most formidable threat to the peace and security of the world at this hour is human nature. The biggest question is not the German question, the Formosa question, the European question, or even the Russian question. The big enigma is the human question. When we begin to cope with this mysterious, unpredictable force called human nature, we are dealing with a factor more potent than politics, more devastating than war, more powerful than the armed might of a nation, and more destructive than the Black Plague. I say this after years of thought, study, observation, travel, and prayer. Externals may be improved, laws may be amended, revolutions may take place, and great movements may be organized. These are all to the good. But unless outward laws are replaced by inner attitudes, little is actually gained. Signed armistices between nations do not in themselves bring the people concerned one step nearer personal inner peace that the whole world is longing for. Jesus Christ was not primarily concerned with political revolution because he knew that a change in government did not mean a change of heart. George Lansbury of England said in his 80th year, as I look back across my life, I see that I have not been unsuccessful. But if I had it to do over again, I think I would give my whole life to the changing of men, for without that change, nothing can be changed. Human nature is capable of rising to the highest heights or sinking to the lowest depths. Give an unreliable, degenerate man a stick of dynamite and he will blow up his neighbor's house or crack a safe. Give a man who has been converted by the power of Christ a stick of dynamite and he will clear a piece of land and make a garden. Give a greedy man who is driven by an ordinate selfishness a gun and he will use it to hold up a bank or shoot his enemy. Give a man redeemed by the power of Christ a gun and he will shoot some game and invite his neighbors over for dinner. Weapons in themselves are not harmful. Only as they are pressed into the hands of designing, degenerate human beings do they become harmful. A few years ago, there lived in Germany two men. One was named Adolf Hitler and the other Albert Schweitzer. Both of them possessed gifts and talents which might have been used to benefit mankind. Hitler, driven by ambition and the lust for power, used his talent to shape the security of the world, leaving a bloody trail of political rape, murder, and bloodshed. Albert Schweitzer, seeing the futility of such a course of action, used his talents to bring healing to a benighted people. He turned a dark jungle into a sunlit paradise, and he did it by God's power in Jesus' name. Our world is more uneasy than it has been in a generation, even though we are living in a current period of so-called peace. Our greatest loss is not prestige, nor influence, nor political power. These are surface things. Our greatest loss is confidence in man. And we've lost confidence in man because man has scrapped his faith in God. When human nature is out of tune with God, the greatest of successes seem only to be stark failures. Hence, a great paradox is taking place in the Western world. In the midst of the greatest economic boom of history, we are experiencing a mental and moral depression. This moral depression is causing men termed successful to take their own lives by the thousands. Within the past several years, Hollywood stars with everything material within their grasp have reached for the poison vial or a bottle of sleeping tablets to end it all. Solomon, wise in the frailties of human nature, once said, Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. So as we look into the marred portrait of this thing called human nature, we see the appalling paradox of power without poise, success without satisfaction, and prosperity without peace. When will we admit that we have failed and stop floundering around in the marshes of futility? What will it take to get us to scrap our doubts, as did Doubting Thomas, and cry, My Lord and my God? I have in my hand an old book called the Bible. It is not true because it is old, but it is old because it is true. Here is what it says about human nature. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I realize that modern psychology tries to exonerate man of his depravity and sin. They say that we're all born with a tendency towards self-centeredness. But can we blame all of the murder, the assault, robbery, slander, thievery, and cruelty of the race on a mild tendency towards self-centeredness? I think not. Human nature has seething within it a violent, fierce, beastly, passionate quality called sin. It is this trait 
this fault in our natures that gives decent people the capacity to be indecent. Respectable men to turn into disrespectable men. Reliable persons to become unreliable. Sober men to become drunkards. Virtuous men to become invirtuous. And good men to degenerate into beasts. The Bible declares that sin is universal. Who can say, says the Bible, I've made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin. Every one of them is gone back. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. The Bible again says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This plague, this disease of man's spirit is universal. It is found in men of every race, color, and creed. Sin is not French. German, Chinese, Japanese, Russian, or American. It knows no racial, lingual, or national bounds. This disease has infected the human family universally. For as the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Self-treatment, man's effort to cure himself of this moral disease, has failed to penetrate this universal plague. Science has done wonderful things for many serious diseases. They found cures for diphtheria, tuberculosis, certain forms of cancer, and now we think that we found a serum for polio. But man has failed to create a serum for sin. The unmistakable symptoms are found in the heart of every one of us. Pride, deceit, evil imaginations, greed, selfishness, lust, and hatred. What can be done about human nature? It is this sin in human nature that causes all the juvenile delinquency in America. It causes all the crime in America. It causes all the problems in the world. It causes all the difficulties that bring about communism, Nazism, and fascism. It is sin within the human heart. How can we cope with it? How can we find an answer to this disease of sin? Is there any hope for the world? Or do we have to go on fighting generation after generation until we destroy ourselves? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to tell you that there is a bright hope. I'm happy to proclaim that something has been done about this greatest of all world problems. Cures are being affected by the hour. A startling specific has been discovered. Hopeless men are finding new hope. Defeated men are discovering real victory. Despondent men have found a new buoyance in joy. Imprisoned men have found a way out. A revolution is going on in the world. Not a political revolt, but a revolt against the bondage of the soul. Not a revolt against the government, but a rebellion against the governing power of sin. Every revolution has its central dominant personality. And the figure around this movement centers in Jesus Christ. He has done something about human nature, something practical, something feasible. He came to earth a few centuries ago to cope with human nature. In his first speech he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that were bruised. He saw men not as creatures with a mild tendency towards self-centeredness, but as poor, broken-hearted, captive, and bruised. He saw our perverted, warped, twisted human natures, and he provided a cure for the infection of evil which has plagued the race for centuries. Isaiah said, He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. In one sweeping, majestic, atoning act, he became the lamb to atone for us, a reconciler to bring us to God, and a liberator of our imprisoned spirits. He did something about human nature, and the cure he brought was as universal as man's sin. Vile men, through faith in him, were made clean. Weak men were made strong. Sinful men were made pure. Into the current of human history, there came a mighty surge of new life. Even skeptical intellectuals like Saul of Tarsus were swept into the life-giving stream. After his nature had been purged by the power of Christ, Paul said, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But that all seems so antiquated, you say. What has that to do with the problems of 1955? Ah, that is what I wanted you to ask. The Bible says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christ can cope with your problem. Within the past five months in Britain and Europe, we've seen multiplied thousands brought under the spell of Jesus Christ. 
We've seen thieves give up their stealing. We've seen alcoholics made sober. We've seen broken, shattered homes restored. We've seen the rich discover in Christ riches they never knew existed. We've seen the poor made content because they were made partakers of his riches. From my vantage point here in Geneva, I challenge the people of every continent where this hour of decision goes to submit your heart and your human nature to Jesus Christ. Is there hope for peace in our time? Can the world look forward to a temporary surcease of war and international bickering? No one has the precise answer. But I do know this. You can have peace. You can have rest. You can have joy. And how can this be, you ask? This Bible I hold in my hand has the answer. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is how your nature can be changed. Millions have trusted him. So can you right now, today. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God in Christ's name, we pray that many people will turn to Christ today and give their hearts and lives to him and have their natures transformed and changed and find peace with God and thus peace with our fellow men. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. When I heard the news on April 5th of the death of the President of the Republic of China, I went to my study and closed the door to pray and meditate. It seemed as though the whole extraordinary life of this legendary leader passed in review before my mind. Only 30 years ago, he was idolized by a generation of Americans with whom he had fought side by side through years of war. He was one of the big four of the Allies in World War II, along with Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill. I could not help but recall in my meditation that as a young revolutionary firebrand and disciple of Sun Yat-sen, he had helped bring an end to the Manchu dynasty. Under his leadership, China was united for the first time in a century. I thought of his marriage to Sun Meiling, one of the world's most intelligent and beautiful women. I remember how during World War II, she addressed a joint session of the United States Congress and captivated all America. I remember that the Generalissimo had reluctantly joined with Mao Zedong and Cho Enlai in order to drive out the Japanese militarist from his land. After years of battles and dissensions and difficulties that plagued all the countries that had been involved in that long war, he was forced to leave his beloved mainland. He went to the poverty-stricken but beautiful island of Taiwan. He turned it into an economic and political stronghold. My wife was born and reared in China. My father-in-law went to China in 1916 as a medical missionary. During his years there, he met and came to admire Generalissimo Zhang Kai-shek and later Madame Zhang. I first met the Generalissimo in 1952. The Korean War was in progress, and I'd gone to spend Christmas with the American troops. After I left Korea, I went to Taipei to see the missionaries and to preach to the Christians and visit the hospitals. And while there, I unexpectedly received an invitation to dinner from the President and Madame Zhang Kai-shek. I was amazed that during my visit, almost the entire conversation had to do with Christianity. I've been asked today to speak about the personal Christian faith of this great man. Close friends in whom I have confidence have shared with me what has been up until now confidential information about their experiences with the President. I believe it would please him and honor our Lord if I shared some of them with you today. As you know, the people of Taiwan have experienced many sorrows. But week before last, they experienced, to quote a friend of mine on the telephone, the greatest of them all. Profound grief and a tragic sense of loss melted the people and caused the tears to flow among the rich, the poor, 
the young and the old. Their leader, who had sat with the mighty Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill, had outlived them all, was dead. I talked with the Generalissimo and Madame Jean Kaishek about their personal faith on a number of occasions. I knew him to be a true believer. And I've heard others who knew him intimately for 50 years say with equal conviction that this indeed was true. What kind of a Christian faith did the Generalissimo have? First, his was a personal faith. It was genuine. The news media have mentioned that the beautiful Sung Mei Ling did not wish to marry him until he became a Christian. When he was courting her, her godly mother was deeply concerned. She sought the help of her pastor to pray with her, and she gave Chang a Bible to read. When Mei Ling urged him to believe and to embrace the Christian faith, he refused, saying that he was not ready. At that time, he was fighting against the warlords in the north of China. On a short trip to Shanghai, he told Mei Ling that he had read the New Testament twice, but he wished to read the Old Testament before making a commitment. In the weeks that followed, he was caught up in a difficult military situation. In desperation, he called on the Christian God of whom he had been reading and told God that if he were delivered, and his life spared, he would publicly confess Christ later. True to his promise, he did make a public profession of his faith in Christ, and he was baptized in 1933. His subsequent life of quiet devotion to Christ was a demonstration of the reality of his faith. A short while before his death, Holy Communion was being served in the tiny church on his estate in Taiwan. He was too weak to attend. He asked the pastor to bring the bread and the wine so that together they could celebrate the communion there in his room just a few days before his death. Secondly, his was a quiet faith. He never used his faith as a political tool in his public appearances in Taiwan, nor did he exploit it for political purposes in his international negotiations. When he spoke politically, he did not mention religion, but when he testified to his Christian convictions in private, his witness for Christ was clear. Almost immediately upon his arrival in Taiwan, he erected a small brick chapel close by his home. Christian worship was observed there every Sunday, and he invited members of his government staff and a few of guest occasionally to worship with him. But this was never publicized in the press. The chapel was a place for sincere worship by the Generalissimo and Madame Jean and their friends. Thirdly, his was an unashamed faith. For a number of years after moving to Taiwan, it was his custom to go on nationwide radio every Christmas Eve to give a message on the significance of the birth of Jesus Christ. Friends of mine who have heard him were grateful for his quiet but bold assertion that Christmas celebrated the coming of the Son of God to earth on Good Friday. He customarily delivered the sermon in his private chapel for friends and associates who gathered there. One of my close friends attended on several occasions. He said that the Generalissimo gave superb messages on the meaning of the cross of Christ. When Christian missionaries fled the mainland to Taiwan, the president opened the door of the entire nation to them. As a result of this, the Christian churches in Taiwan have increased 2,000% in numbers. Today, Taiwan has some of the most dynamic, fastest growing churches in the world. One of the most important decisions that he made concerning Christianity was in 1951. Leaders of the Pocket Testament League, an American organization which since World War I had been distributing New Testaments to military personnel, visited the president in his office. They asked his permission to distribute Bibles to his army. He replied instantly, good, good. He then voluntarily issued a statement 
that was publicized throughout the army and throughout Taiwan. In it, he said, and I quote this remarkable statement, quote, It always gives me pleasure to have people read and study the Bible. Since the Bible is the voice of the Holy Spirit, it reveals the righteousness of God in his love. Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, gave his life and shed his blood to save those who believe in him. His righteousness exalts the nation. Christ is the cornerstone of all freedoms. His love covers all sins. All who believe in him shall have eternal life. End quote. But he did not walk alone. Madame Zhang, his beloved wife, stood by his side in her Christian faith as well as in her work. For more than 20 years, she has led a weekly prayer group of influential women in the city of Taipei. Offerings from this prayer group support Christian chaplains in the army hospitals across the nation. Fourthly, the president was a man of the Bible. Following his conversion to Christianity, he studied the Bible seriously so that he might intelligently understand the Christian faith and the God whom he worshipped. From that time on, it was his lifetime habit to read the Bible on his knees every morning. A longtime friend of mine preached at the Generalissimo's church some time ago. He spoke on a theme that was new to the Generalissimo. Later, as the Generalissimo talked to the speaker about the sermon, he called for the Bible. When my friend looked at it, he said that he had never seen such a dog-eared, well-marked Bible. Verse after verse was underlined with different colored pens. Chiang Kai-shek loved the Word of God and read it faithfully. His favorite verse was Matthew 10:28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but rather fear the one who can kill the soul and the body in hell. This fact alone speaks volumes concerning the reality of President Chong's faith and confidence in God that sustained him through violence, war, and difficulty, and the many other crises which he faced. Finally, Generalissimo Zhang was a man of prayer. From his early days when he battled the warlords and the Japanese in China until the present, he quietly backed all his activities and associates in prayer. It was his personal habit to pray alone every morning after reading the Bible. At night, he prayed with his wife. When a typhoon of great intensity threatened the island of Taiwan a few years ago, he retired to his room to pray. When the typhoon had passed by harmlessly, he returned from his room. And it's public knowledge among the leadership in Taiwan that just a few hours before the president died, he called together his wife, his son, and five or six of the leading men of the government. This included the new president, Mr. C.K. Yen, also a Christian of many years. He spoke to them about his last wishes. It was his verbal testament to his successors. The first words they heard from his lips on his deathbed were the words, Jesus Christ. Then he talked to them of his lifelong struggle to bring to China the principles of Sun Yat-sen and the democratic revolution. And then in conclusion he said, these things and my Christian faith I have never departed from. If the Generalissimo were to speak for himself today, to this audience, I think I know what he might say. He would remember the Apostle Paul during the last days of his life. He was chained in the Mamertine dungeon in Rome awaiting the executioner's final blow. And as he waited, he wrote a last will and testament to young Timothy. I think the Generalissimo would have joined him in one part of that letter and would leave for us an imperishable witness to his own life he would have said as Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. 
Today, we do not say goodbye to President Chiang Kai-shek, but as Christians, we say au revoir till we meet again. Thank you.